Hey everyone, happy Sunday evening and welcome back to the Battle Cry. I'm your host, Mark Meckler, President of Convention of States, and we have a big week for you. I mean, this is a big month for us. It's been incredible. This actually is the 10th anniversary of the Convention of States project. So August 13th was the official date just passed. 10 years of grassroots activism all over the country. We've built the largest self-governing grassroots army in American history. You folks, our volunteers, our supporters are in every single state legislative district in the United States of America, in every congressional district in the United States of America. And there is not a place in this country that you can't or don't affect, politically speaking. I'd say, and culturally speaking as well. It's been an incredible 10 years. You can look on our website, see some of the highlights from the 10 years. But suffice it to say, we've come a long way because 10 years ago when Mike Ferris and I started this project, it was me and Mike Ferris and just a handful of employees. And the volunteers started coming on right away. Some of you who are volunteers have been with us for all 10 years, maybe nine or eight years. You've been with us for the long haul and it's been an amazing ride. And one of the things that we've done over the years throughout this ride, back in 2016, we did our first simulated convention of states in Colonial Williamsburg. We did it back in 2016 for a couple of reasons. One was to provide proof of concept. Nobody had ever done an Article 5 convention of states, and we wanted to show what it would look like, how it would work, what it would feel like, what the rules would be like, how the process and procedure would play out, and, and just generally prove that it could be done. And so we did it. It was very successful in 2016. And I got to be honest with you, I said we'd never do it again. <laughs> and the reason I said we'd never do it again is not because it was bad or too hard or not exciting or too expensive or anything like that. I said we'd never do it again because it was perfect, because it came off just perfectly. And when you do an event like a simulated convention of states, what it means is that you put this event together, you set the table, you get it ready for all the commissioners to show. And when they show up, you turn it over to them. Now, if you've ever planned an event, if you've ever been involved in something like that, whether a wedding or a conference or often even a party, you plan everything out in advance. You know, minute to minute how everything is going to go start to finish. But when it comes to putting a simulated convention together, it's not like that. We set the table. We invite the commissioners to come. And then it's really up to them what happens. When the gavel falls, they elect their own officers. They decide how things are gonna proceed. They decide exactly how the committees will operate. And so it's very different. So in 2016, when it went so perfectly, I thought, yeah, I'm not sure that we wanna try and tempt fate and do it again. But over the years, the demand grew and we always respond to our grassroots and our grassroots wanted to see it done again because a lot of the folks that had been around in 2016 there were a lot more folks by 2023, they hadn't had a chance to see a convention of states take place live. A lot of the legislators that were around in 2016 are no longer in their legislatures. There are new legislators and they wanted the chance to participate in a convention of states live. And so maybe against better judgment, I don't know, I'll let you guys decide. We decided to do a second simulated convention of states under article 5 of the united states constitution and once again we did it in colonial williamsburg why williamsburg well because we traveled all over the country looking for a site that would feel the same that would have that historic import of being in a place where liberty was born where the ideas upon which this country was founded were first discussed and frankly we just couldn't find any other place like colonial williamsburg so we chose it again we went back there we invited commissioners from all over the country, from all 50 states. And indeed, we had commissioners from 49 states attend. And I thought this was kind of funny and ironic, maybe showing God's finger in it, but we had the commissioner from Rhode Island all signed up to come and then she couldn't make it at the last minute due to some family obligations. If you know your history about the 1787 convention, you know that Rhode Island chose not to attend. So once again, Rogue Island is Rogue Island, and they weren't there. So we had commissioners from 49 states all over the country. We gathered the very first night. We had an opening reception, and we had Patrick Henry speak to us. That was fantastic. He's a great historical impersonator. He set the stage for us. He told us what it was like in Colonial Williamsburg. He told us about his life there, and he gave us some of his rec recollections from those times 
He spoke to us. He gave us part of his give me liberty or give me death speech. And I would say for myself, I was even more inspired than I already was. And I heard the same thing from a lot of the legislators and their spouses who attended as well. Certainly our staff enjoyed it too. And then Thursday morning was the opening plenary session. And that session opened with Ken Ivory as the interim president of the convention. And he was the interim president because Representative Ivory from Utah was the president of our last simulated convention. So we had him open the day and we also had him run the election. But I wanna start with a few snippets for you. First, I wanna start with some of my remarks and I got a chance to open the day, some of my remarks to the commissioners gathered there in the hall in Colonial Williamsburg. The federal government was always intended to be a government of limited enumerated powers. Today, the federal government is a government of unlimited, essentially unenumerated powers, largely the effect of an overreaching government for decades, over a century at least, and a Supreme Court that rubber stamps and encourages that encroachment on state authority and the sovereign authority of the people of these United States. So today you will enter into solemn and serious debate about amendments which might be proposed to be sent to the states for ratification in order that we might restrain that federal government and once again, put it back within the bounds of the United States Constitution. You know, I love watching that. I don't normally like watching myself, but I get that feeling of the moment when the convention opens and, and what that felt like to stand in front of the room, look out, see all the commissioners there. It's kind of an overwhelming feeling. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of seriousness and intensity in the room. And so to be there and, and be able to stand in front of that room was an incredible honor. I also, when I stand in front of a room like that, what I feel like is I'm representing you the millions of grassroots that believe in Convention of States and are out there and involved. This month also, by the way, we hit our 2.5 millionth petition. Congratulations to our Illinois team for collecting that petition signature at the State Fair in Illinois. So I represent, when I stand in the front of that room, millions of people. And it's kind of overwhelming. And looking out and seeing all those legislators, it's kind of overwhelming. But it's definitely fun and it feels historic. And we also had opening remarks from my good friend and co-founder, Mike Ferris. Mike always brings his special gravitas as the founder of the homeschool movement in America, a former president of Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF, the largest religious liberties legal organization in the nation. So here are a few of Mike Ferris's remarks. He said, we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And for this reason, governments are instituted among men. So the reason we want to have limited government, which is mainly the focus of what we're doing here, how do we limit the federal government? The reason for limited government is more freedom. When, when government makes the choice, you don't get to make the choice. When you make the choice, you have freedom. We want to increase freedom by limiting the power of government to make too many choices in our lives. And so that's what you're about. Thank you for being here. Thank you for, for all you do, and I really agree with what Mark said last night. I think this really will be looked at as the Annapolis Convention of this generation. So God bless you. Thank you for being here. There's never a time when I don't like listening to Mike Ferris, uh, and so I can hear that over and over. Look, he just, he always has so much to say in just a few words. He's got so much wisdom it's just an honor and a privilege to work side by side with him. I never knew, I never imagined that he would come back to Convention of States after retiring from ADF. So what a privilege and an honor to have him involved again in the Convention of States project. Uh, finally, uh, definitely not least, is my good friend, Senator Rick Santorum. You know, Rick joined Convention of States. It's now, must be pushing two years ago, 18 months ago, something like that. And he has brought so much more to the organization than I ever anticipated. I knew Rick personally as a friend, we've hunted and fished together, but I'd never worked with him directly. And to have the chance to work with him over the last couple of years, to see him in the field, how he relates to the grassroots, how they love him, how the legislators love him. Rick's been a true conservative warrior in American politics for a long time. And he gave what I would say was the most inspiring, most important speech of the entire week there in Colonial Williamsburg. Here are some highlights from that speech. 
And they didn't design this Constitution for angels and statesmen. You know, all what, you know what they really are asking you to do under Article 5? Is do what everybody, whether it's the school board or the, the rotary or whatever, everybody and, or you and your own family do, <laughs> unfortunately. And that is act in your own self-interest. So all I'm expecting at an Article 5 convention is that the folks coming to that convention will act in your own self-interest, which means taking power away from Washington and bringing it back to the states. If you simply do that, then you will accomplish what angels and statesmen will do. Because all this effort is about is to try to stifle Washington from destroying this country and bring some of the power and freedom back to the people and to the states. So act in your own self-interest. We don't need you to be angels. Oh, man, every time I relive it, I feel great. This one I'm going to watch over and over. He definitely put the charge on the legislators, on the commissioners who were there to do their duty, to step up and to save the nation. And it was phenomenal. So after that was over, we had opening remarks from me and from Mike Ferris and Rick Santorum. Then Ken Ivory took the stage. He took the gavel and he went up there and he began to lead the convention. And so I just want you to get a little bit of feel for what it looked like when the convention started. Here's a clip from just the very beginning of convention with Ken Ivory taking the gavel and beginning the roll call. But we have a machine that's out of balance. Doesn't matter who drives the machine anymore. Doesn't matter if they drive the machine to the left or drive the machine to the right. The machine is blowing smoke. It's losing parts. It's time to put the machine in the repair shop and change the oil, tune it up, so we got another 245 years to go on this machine. George Washington made the statement, if in the opinion of the people, the distribution or modification of the constitutional powers are ever in any particular wrong, let it be changed by an amendment in the way the Constitution designates. He said, let there be no change by usurpation, for though in one instant that may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. We're right at that point. And so now it is absolutely the time that we rally to be leaders among leaders. And that's the opportunity we have over the next two days to work on this. Mr. Secretary, please. Thank you, Mr. President. We will call the roll by state. State chairpersons, please report present if your state is here. Alabama. Present. Alaska. Present. Arizona. Present. Arkansas. Present. California. Present. Colorado. Present. Connecticut. Present. For me personally, the roll call is one of the most inspiring things that happens. I walked to the back of the room and stood with Rita Peters, our senior vice president for national legislative affairs, and stood with her. She was with me at the original convention. We stood in the back of the room in 2016 together, and we relived that moment there in 2023, just a few days ago, and it was just as weighty. Hearing the roll call, hearing each state said that they say that they were present, that they had their delegation there, and then coming to a quorum, it's just hard to describe that moment. If you watch it, I think you're going to feel some of what I felt. You could watch all of this uh, on our website. So what I want to do now is I want to kind of go through for you how the process played out, and then we're going to go through the actual amendments themselves. So on the first day, you saw Representative Ivory call the roll, essentially set the stage, and then he conducted the election for the president of this convention. And we had four who originally submitted their names to run for president of convention. One of them dropped out just before the election. Uh, so there were three who were actually running. And I thought they all did a great job. They came up, they stood at the, the, the lectern, and they did two minutes each. And we're not going to show those. You can watch those online if you want to go see them. They did two minutes each. And ultimately, Woody Jenkins from Louisiana was elected to be the president of the convention. Now, Woody's a big supporter of Convention of States. He runs some local newspapers down in Louisiana. 
Uh, and he hasn't been in the legislature for 23 years, I think is the number. He used to be a legislator. So that shows you like people were not just looking for legislators as their leaders. Woody's just a regular guy, a citizen, a journalist. He has some experience as a legislator, but he's the one that all the commissioners chose. And it was a close vote. It was 25-23, uh, but he ended up winning that. And so exciting to see him take the stage and stand on the dais and start the convention. He had a little bit of business to conduct when he started the convention. He divided us all into committees and off they went. Now the delegates themselves, the commissioners had chosen their own committee assignments. We tried to put everybody in the committee they wanted to be in. There were three committees according to the resolution. There was the fiscal restraints committee, the term limits committee and the scope and jurisdiction committee. And so mostly we allowed the commissioners just to choose which committee they wanted to be in. And off they went on Thursday to debate proposed amendments. Commissioners themselves had submitted amendments that they wanted to debate and those had priority. But we also had over 350 uh, proposals submitted by the grassroots. We categorized those where they were duplicative. We got rid of the duplicates and we submitted those in a notebook to the delegates, to the commissioners, to the convention, because we wanted them to have a chance to get input from you, the grassroots. Your input was valuable. I can tell you they relied on it a lot. So what I did during this time period on Thursdays, I wandered around and I went from committee to committee. Again, remember, I don't have any input. I don't have any authority to say anything, to drive anything. I literally can't even raise my hand and talk in a committee because I'm not a commissioner. So I watched the committees be run. They, were, they each were run differently. I thought that was super interesting. Representative Ken Ivory ran the Scope and Jurisdiction Committee. Dan Eubanks from Mississippi ran the, uh, the Term Limits Committee. And Dan Lundberg from uh, Colorado ran the, uh, the Fiscal Restraints Committee. Sorry, I'm drawing a blank there on names. And they were all different. And that was really interesting to me. The, the committee took on the flavor that the committee chair imparted to it. They're all run in different ways. But all of them also broke out into subcommittees to talk about a variety of potential amendments in their committee. So the committee chairs ran it. As I walked around and I'm taking a deep breath, I was a little bit stressed out because I went into some of the committees and it was pretty heated. I heard a lot of serious disagreement, principled disagreement. And when I say heated, it's not that people were impolite or rude to each other. It's just people were passionate. And it's important to remember that most of these folks are Republicans. Most of them would consider themselves conservatives. So these are people who largely agree ideologically and they had trouble reaching agreement. People had different amendments that they thought were more important than others. People had different pieces of different amendments that they thought were more important than others. Uh, some amendments never even got considered because they weren't considered a priority by the committee. And that means somebody who had proposed that amendment was getting sort of from their perspective, the short end of the stick. And I saw some fairly heated exchanges. And as that was going on, I just thought, oh my goodness, are we gonna get anything out of this? Are we gonna come to any fruitful conclusion or is this just gonna end up crashing and burning? And I love that. I love that it was real, that it, people were passionate about it. People took it seriously. Same as in 2016, I heard a lot of people come out and say, it's hard for me to take this like it's not real. Like I go in there and we're dealing with the constitution, the foundational document in our system of governance, and I'm taking it so seriously, like it's, like it's actually going to happen. And it is actually gonna happen, ultimately. This wasn't the real convention, but one's coming and this was the practice run for it. So I think that kind of seriousness was called for and it was done. And so the committees came out, each of them made their proposals. Uh, they had the opportunity to come forward with three proposals. Not all the committees did. In fact, the financial or fiscal restraints committee only came out with one. They came out with a balanced budget amendment, but it's a lot more complicated than other proposals. So that might be part of the reason they only came out with one. I wanna to talk to you a little bit now about what happened at the end of the day, because something extraordinary happened. We went out to dinner, we went to a tavern, which was a tavern where the framers would have met and, and debated the issues of the day. And we filled that tavern with the commissioners from all over the country. Taverns back then, it wasn't like one big room. It was like a house, frankly, with bedrooms and a kitchen and a living room and an entry hall and just a few tables in each. So we divided people up, not necessarily even according to their state delegation, but we divided them up in a way that we thought people would have great conversation. And there really was a lot of incredible conversation. 
it was loud in the tavern. So we went over, had dinner for a couple hours in the tavern, and then we walked back. We, we actually had been led over by a fife and drum corps. That was pretty cool. We walked back, and after we got back, the president of the convention, Woody Jenkins, had called for a committee on style. Now, a committee on style is not uncommon in a legislature. Basically, they just review things that are drafted to make sure that they are stylistically correct. And by that, they mean punctuation, spelling, grammar, no substantive changes can be made by a commission on style or a committee on style, only stylistic things. So the committee met, must have been about 10 p.m. by the time the committee got together. And the committee was made up, I think the committee chairs were in there, the committee secretaries were in there, the parliamentarians were in there. Robert Kelly was the secretary of the overall convention. He was in there, I was in there, and Rita Peters was in there. And she's the mastermind that made the whole convention run that set up all the structures. So we're in there. It starts to get pretty intense in there. Uh, and it gets intense because people are suggesting changes to amendments from committee that are substantive changes. They're substituting words or phrases. And there's a heated argument about whether or not you can do that. The parliamentarian says you can't. Some committee's chairs say that you can and it gets pretty hot. I mean, I think people are even, I would say at some points, angry with each other in there. It's not good. Me and Rita stepped out and we were very concerned about the way it was going, the parliamentarian stepping in, and it was just a little bit crazy and messy. And ultimately, uh, what happened is the, the parliamentarian kind of put his foot down, uh, the vice president of the convention kind of put his foot down and said, look, gentlemen, if we make substantive changes, we're going to go into convention tomorrow and people are going to be angry at us and they're going to be rightly angry at us. And that the vice president of the convention was Jason Rapert from Arkansas. And he really stepped in like a statesman and stopped the debates that were happening in that committee. I was in there and it was, like I said, intense. I was worried about what was going to happen. I left the room for a little bit. Rita and I were talking, when we came back into the room, uh, they were being led in prayer by Jason Rapert. And he had said to the men in there, we have to cover this in prayer, like the framers did at convention, like Ben Franklin called for. And he prayed, and, and several other of the commissioners prayed. I think there were four or five really heartfelt prayers that took place in that room. Uh, and it was not some kind of quick and easy thing. I mean, these were men who were pouring their hearts into it, who were crying out to the Lord to watch over this endeavor because we were going to treat it as important as we felt it was. And we needed the Lord's intervention, just like we always have in this country. And after the prayers were done, the attitude, the demeanor in the room was entirely different. Men who had been fighting it out seemed like men who were brothers in arms. And they were steadfast in their resolve to see this through to a successful close of convention. So I went up to my room after that. I told my wife what had happened, uh, that I had seen these men pray. I'd felt God intervene. And I felt much better about what was going to happen the next day at convention. So I had a good night's sleep, if not too short. <laughs> and we started the day the next morning. And the chairman took the dais or, and went up there and gaveled the session in. And it was a very interesting start to the session because the first amendment that was to be discussed got proposed. And when it was proposed, um, there was discussion about it. The, the president of the convention was leading the way in the discussion. And he was leading the way in what I would describe as a very forceful manner. And I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way, I mean it with all due respect, it was not what I expected, but he was questioning and he was driving the debate and pushing people in particular directions. And at some point, somebody in the back of the room, might've been the Wyoming delegation, stood up and said, point of order. And the president of the convention, President Jenkins, recognized the delegate and took that point of order. The point of order was, you're not allowed to do this. And he said, what do you mean now? And he said, you're not allowed to ask all these questions and drive the debate in a particular direction. And I'll never forget the phrase. He said something like, you're supposed to steer the ship, not build the ship. And so the president was a bit taken aback. 
I thought he handled it beautifully. He said, are you making a motion that I'm not able to ask questions and drive the debate? And he said, yes. And somebody yelled second. So now it's pretty tense in the room, right? And there's gonna be a vote. Uh, all in favor of allowing the president to continue questioning the way he has been, say aye, and all opposed say nay. And it was a voice vote. And that means everybody just said it at once. You had all the ayes, and then all the nays. And if it's clear the way it works on a voice vote is then the president declares who won and who lost that vote, which side, and then he gavels that and you move on. And in this case, my read standing at the back of the room, dead center, the eyes and the nays were equal, very close to equal. I couldn't tell the difference. And the chairman, the, I'm sorry, the president, President Jenkins, in a, in a moment of what I would describe as God-inspired statesmanship, said, the nays have it. And he gaveled himself down and he stepped back and he took a much more gentle role in leading the convention. And I was, I was awestruck with admiration for the president in that moment. He could have said he won. Somebody could have called for a, a count, an actual voice count of how, who was voting which way. But he did the statesman-like thing and he stepped back and he listened to the wishes of convention and allowed it to be run in a way that the entire, uh, entire convention would feel comfortable with. I was so impressed with that. And, and there was another moment as the convention was being run that I was so impressed with the president of the convention as well. Uh, there came a moment where he turned towards Jason Rapert, his vice president of convention, and said, I'd now like to turn the gavel over to the vice president of the convention, Jason Rapert. And Rapert stood up, represent, or sorry, Senator Rapert, I think it is, and, and he ran the convention for a couple hours until lunch. And I was just, that level of statesmanship, the, the willingness to share the gavel like that, the willingness to sort of be pushed back off the stage a little bit, out of the, the front line a little bit by convention, really impressed me. So I just got to say kudos to Jason Rapert, kudos to Woody Jenkins, kudos to Ken Ivory for how he opened the convention. It, it ran like it should ran. It, it ran like there were statesmen running it. I was very impressed. So let's go through uh, a little bit. I want you to see a little bit, some highlights of what the debates on the floor look like. If you haven't had a chance to watch those debates, producer G is going to give you a little bit of a taste of what it looked like on the floor, some of the heated debate that was going on, a little bit of the process, so you can just have a feel for that. We're really going into employees, and I think that there's just a problem with that, Mr. President. I strongly believe that the Constitution should not be getting into this level of detail uh, for, for term limits or for rules of engagement, so I rise in opposition respectfully. Thank you. I want to talk about Section 5, where it says the office's employees of the executive branch shall serve at will. So I'm going to echo, echo Representative Montenegro's. Um, when you are in, this applies to so such a vast amount of bureaucracy that when you have an employee who is like designing or building our airplanes, our war machines, they have to be able to make decisions based on engineering and not political decisions. And that can get really sticky with where contracts are and everything like that. And so when you have then the, the ability to then politicize some of this and fire employees who are not agreeing with decisions, then you, you actually threaten national security. Now I understand that you have the Environmental Protection Agencies, you have DHHS, you have all these other branches that are impacted that get stuck in the minutia of bureaucracy, but there are some aspects of this where it is truly just employment that they need to get the job done. And when we start interfering with that, then we can put our country at stake. If we are not willing to truly limit what government actually is, we have to be real about what government actually is. It is not our elected officials, not currently, not when we're looking at the feds, the government is the administrators, it is the bureaucrats, it is the staff, it is the people who are able to make a lifetime. We, we complain about career politicians. You wanna know who has careers in politics? It's people who've never run for office. It's people who've never been elected. I would submit to you that without this, we're actually harming our ability 
to hold our government accountable by passing term limits without addressing the administrative state. Now, this language may be imperfect. That's a product of the fact that this is a simulated convention and we have limited time. If we had the ability to really chew this through, we could pinpoint it to where it has the effect that I think many of us want it to have. But I think it's important to signal to those who are watching that we're serious about taking an ax to the root of the administrative state, or as some call it, the deep state. Let's pass this, thank you. All right, so, uh, <laughs> Senator, uh, Senator. Okay, so you get a feel for what it looks like. Now, hopefully that tempts you to go watch the whole thing at conventionofstates.com and see the entire process on the floor on Friday. It's all there. What I wanna do for you now is I wanna run through exactly what made it through convention. So you can find a blog on our website that has this uh, at conventionofstates.com. In the news section, you'll find the official proposals. But I want to run through those proposals with you. So the first proposal, number one, was term limits. Uh, and and uh, I want to run through what the term limits came out to be. And this was a little bit, um, I got to say, controversial among the grassroots. And I understand it. It says no person can be elected to serve in the House of Representatives more than nine full terms. So that would be 18 years in the House or uh, more than three terms in the Senate. So that would be 18 years as well. Uh, it says the article doesn't disqualify any person from completing a term in Congress to which they were already appointed or elected. Section two says no person shall serve in Congress for more than 24 years in total. So a 24 year total term limit, House and Senate. Now, a lot of people said, oh, that's way too long, that's ridiculous. But when I talked to a lot of legislators and when I talked to people who were in the term limits committee, they said, we have to remember that the average member of Congress serves 11 years right now, 11 years, I didn't know that. And they also said that it's important to remember that the people that we are frustrated about, the people that we would like to see term limits on, the Pelosi's, the Schumer's, the McConnell's, the Grassley's, maybe even uh, Kevin McCarthy. These are people who've been there way longer than 24 years. So the perceived problem with term limits that we have in the United States of America is fixed by a 24 year term limit. Again, remember most congressmen don't serve more than 11 years, that's the average. Now on a personal level, I'd still like to see it a little lower. I think I, I might've been an 18 year guy. I understand the necessity of institutional knowledge, but I think in 18 years, you can figure it out. Maybe you don't even belong there. Uh, the second one was federal term limits and judicial jurisdiction. Section one said, the Supreme Court of the United States shall consist of nine judges, any six of whom constitute a quorum. Well, of course we gotta do this because the left is looking to pack the Supreme Court right now. They believe it's the only way that they can turn the Supreme Court into another, uh, sorry, another, exec another legislative branch. Can't even speak here today. Uh, and so they wanna pack the court and this is a way to prevent court packing. The American people don't want court packing. Section two says each of the several states shall have standing to bring an action challenging the constitutionality of any action of the executive branch or any enactment of Congress. This essentially puts this, the teeth back in the 10th amendment, gives the states the right to sue, which has largely been taken away from them by the federal courts. So that might be my favorite, certainly one of my favorite amendments that came out. In the Fiscal Restraints Committee, there was one proposal and one proposal only, and it is a balanced budget proposal. Uh, I'm gonna summarize it. I don't wanna read the whole thing. It's, it's a five section uh, amendment. Section five actually says it's not effective until three years after the passage of this amendment, the ratification. That's to give the government a chance to adjust. It says that the Congress has to have a budget. I think this is really important because we haven't had a budget for a long time. And it says federal expenditures for each fiscal year can't exceed average annual revenue collected in the prior three years. So whatever they've been collecting, they can't spend more than the average of that. And it says all expenditures are included, including interest on the debt is included, and it includes all revenue of the US except, and this is important, not borrowing. Borrowing is not revenue. Any surplus of revenue over expenditures needs to be applied to outstanding fiscal debt, federal debt. Section two says whenever, this is the exception clause, whenever two thirds of both houses of Congress by roll call vote 
say that it's necessary they can exceed the spending limit for one fiscal year by borrowing as provided in the second clause of the eighth section of Article One of the Constitution. So this is the emergency clause, right? If, if you get into a war, uh, then it takes two thirds of both houses. And I might have wanted something even more strict than this, but it is hard to get a two thirds vote of both houses. Uh, you know, it's no party generally has a two thirds majority. So you've got to get both parties to agree on increasing spending. Uh, so I like that. Section four said, nothing in this amendment shall be construed to allow for an increase in taxes without express approval of Congress. So you can't have the courts do it, of course, and you can't have the president do it. It's got to be Congress. All right. Uh, the next one was on federal legislative and a executive jurisdiction. So this is from the jurisdiction committee. It's a jurisdictional proposal. And uh, it says that this is about the Commerce Clause, right? So the Commerce Clause has been widely abused. It used to be limited to just regulating the shipment of goods across state lines. Now it regulates everything. And most agencies of the federal government exist under quote unquote Commerce Clause authority. So this was an attempt to put the Commerce Clause authority back in the constitutional box. Section one says commerce among the states means buying, selling, or transportation of goods or services across line, state lines, right? So it's not education, it's not environment. It's actually buying and selling goods. Section Congress or Section two says Congress can't delegate rulemaking functions related to commerce to any executive official or agency. So this takes power away from the agencies and it makes the Congress responsible for all of this stuff, which is the way it should have always been. Section three says any law or regulation existing at the time of ratification of this amendment, which is now in conflict with the amendment, is null and void two years after the date of ratification. That gets rid of all these agencies because they have authorizing laws, which would now be in violation of this amendment. And this is an important one. It says, section four, for purposes of the constitution, navigable waters is limited to surface waters actively used for the transport of goods and commerce among the states. Why that's important is because federal government has been trying to say that a puddle in your front yard is navigable water. And so therefore they have the right to regulate it. So we're defining down what it means to its logical meaning, which is it's actually navigable. All right, so that's the um, Commerce Clause redefinition. I love that, that might be the most important one. Uh, next is Federal Legislative and Executive Jurisdiction Proposal 2. And this is what is called an abrogation amendment. And what it means is it gives the state's authority to overturn laws of Congress, an act of the president, anything an administrative agency does, and so it says that the states have that authority and that that authority is effective when a simple majority of the legislatures of the states declare the provision or provisions of federal law to be abrogated. It can also be applied to provisions of federal law which exist when that amendment is ratified. And it says that state executive and judicial branches have no authority or involvement in the process. This is state legislatures only. Section three says no government entity or official can take any action to enforce a provision of federal law once it's abrogated by the states according to this amendment. And that any attempt to do that would be enjoined by a federal or state court of general jurisdiction. I love it. It says also there's no qualified or sovereign immunity if you try to enforce a law that's been abrogated by the states. Like this is important to allow the states to push back against the federal government. I'm not sure that that's ratifiable because it says a simple majority, 51%, 26 states could do that well. Republicans have 26 states now. It's hard for me to imagine you can reach the 38 state threshold for that. But I think the point is well made and whether that could pass or not, I think it sends a serious message to Washington, DC. Okay, finally, last but not least, really important and really detailed is, uh, the Federal Lands Amendment. And basically what this says is that the national government can't own, regulate, or control land except for purposes expressly enumerated in Article One, and that the national government can't own any more than 10% of land and mineral rights in any given county or county equivalent without the express consent of the legislature of the state. Congress has to return all other lands to the states and, uh, for the purpose of the amendment, control means any combination of federal regulations, treaties, land use, 
This is Ken Ivory's representative, Ken Ivory's pet project. This returns most federal lands to state control. So that's a summary. And I realize I've gone a little bit long here today. I apologize for going long with y'all, but I want you to kind of just have a feel for what happened at convention. Here's what I would say in closing. I don't think these are necessarily all the amendments that should be proposed. I don't think that these are necessarily the right amendments to be proposed. I love some of them. I'm not thrilled with others. I don't think the language is necessarily perfect. We have to remember that the process here was the purpose. In other words, holding a simulated convention of states was the point, not getting the right amendments out. In a real convention, that convention would take place not over two days or three days, it would take months. Literally, we would have months to debate and discuss appropriate kinds of amendments. States would take years in advance, and, and we're gonna be working on that, helping legislators to map out what amendments they want, to get the language right, to debate it. We're gonna have an online caucus for doing that stuff. And they would come in with perfectly crafted amendments and debate those as opposed to doing it in committee in one day and going to the floor the next day. And then finally, and most importantly to me as a grassroots guy is, you will have influence on the process. In other words, your state delegation will be there and they might be arguing for 24 year term limits and you and your fellow citizens in your state might be calling your state legislature and saying, hey, we're from Texas and we believe in 18 year term limits, not 24. And so you'll be able to put appropriate pressure as a citizen of your state on your state legislature to do the right thing in convention. We're gonna get much more well thought out, much more detailed proposals out of a real convention than a simulated convention. But one thing I think we definitively proved is that the convention works, and this is really important for the naysayers, that much chance of running away, zero chance. Why? Look, we had people of like mind in the rooms, and even they argued, even they couldn't agree on most things. It was very difficult. The idea that you're gonna get the states in convention, some Democrat, more being Republican, and they're all gonna agree on something that we wouldn't like and put that out as an amendment, that doesn't make any sense. It's gonna be hard to get amendments out of convention. It's gonna take a lot of work. And I worry more about, can we get enough amendments out of convention versus are we gonna have a runaway convention? So that's it. I lived it. I was there. I wanted to give you a firsthand feeling for what it was like to be there, give you those amendments. Uh, and if you're really interested in this, you're like me and you kind of geek out on this stuff, you can go to conventionofstates.com. You watch the entire Friday floor session, the plenary session, of the second ever simulated convention of states. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for being with us on this 10 year journey. If you're not part of convention of states, go to conventionofstates.com, sign the petition, click the take action tab, go to the store, buy some swag, tell your friends about it, and let's save the nation together.